Well, good morning. It is great to be together. What do you think of the seating? This is our second week doing it. It's kind of like, I don't know, it feels like you're around a campfire or something, only there's no s'mores. So uh, I'm not sure how we'll fix that, but, um, but it's kind of fun. So, you know, if you like the kind of half recline uh, theater seating, we have that for you. If you like the, you know, gather around the table, have some plates to put your coffee, we have this for you here at the front. And so it's just kind of fun to change things up for a bit, and uh, we'll see how it goes this summer. I wonder... Um, How many of you or any of you here in the room or online uh, on Pinterest? Any any show of hands? Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. Pinterest is one of those, like, it's kind of like a new Google, right? If you want to know how to do a nice tablescape or a recipe or uh, what to do with those, uh, I don't know, wood crates or skids that, like, all of us must have lying around somewhere, we go to Pinterest. And I didn't see any guy's hands, but I know... You're on Pinterest. You just don't want to admit it. Anyway, Pinterest is one of those places where we also see a lot of inspirational quotes, right? You may have seen this one. This one is from the 20th century uh, motivational writer, William Arthur Ward. He said, if you can imagine it, you can achieve it. If you can dream it, you can become it. Now, that looks like something you'd see on a mug or a T-shirt or painted on a wall somewhere. I don't know if anybody believes that. I think maybe a lot of people do. If it were only that easy, if you can dream it, you can achieve it. But it certainly speaks to the power of image. The one thing uh, William Arthur Ward, there's a name, knew was the power of image, right? We know people in multi-level marketing companies or striving for a goal, and they have pictures on their fridge and their mirror and all over their house of goals that they want to achieve. By seeing those pictures day in, day out, it motivates them to keep selling or saving or whatever it is they have in their picture. Those who are on weight loss programs or fitness programs, right, might have a picture of your ideal self or your former self somewhere in the house to keep you motivated to pump that that weight, that iron, to keep running, whatever it is you do for fitness. Olympic athletes, believe it or not, this is part of their training regimen, is this mental imagery. Daily, sometimes more than once a day, they will actually mentally go through all the maneuvers perfectly in their mind in order to align mind and body so that they can perform whatever it is they have to perform perfectly. Images are powerful. They're powerfully formative. And we know that, don't we, when it comes especially to images of ourselves. If we have an image of ourself that's less than, it can be debilitating. It can be even destructive. And images of others, entire people groups, get translated into labels, don't they? The Nazis would call the Jews rats. The Hutus would call the Tutsis cockroaches during the Rwandan genocide. And it paves the way to excuse hate and to excuse violence and even genocide. And I suppose psychologically, it's easier to crush a cockroach or exterminate a rat than it is a human being. But that's what images can do, both positively and negatively. They are potent tools. And we have the same with our images of God. Those are some of the most powerful images that we have, is our images of God. It's either deformative or it's formative. And it matters how we image God. It impacts how we see the world, how we see others, how we see ourselves. And I wonder, have you ever thought, how do you image God? How do you imagine God to be? It might be one of the most important questions that you ever sit with, that you ever ask yourself. And it's powerful because although it's formed in our mind, we think through things, ideas form our images, they actually go deeper than that into our emotions and into our spirits. They lodge somewhere deep within us. And while we may think we believe something about God, our images, what we actually hold deep within us, is is what's true about our beliefs. For instance, you might know in your head, you might think God is good and loving and kind. 
But if you're constantly living in fear of God, in fear of God's judgment, God's punishment, God's disappointment, then maybe your image of God is more like the retributive tyrant than the tender parent. Even though in your mind you know God is good and loving and kind. Do you see the power of image? It matters how we image God. And in today's passage, we're going to see how an image should and can inform our reading of a text. And if you're just joining us online or here in the building, we are trekking through the adventure of Jesus' life. We're about a year in or more. We're halfway through the book of Luke, which is one of four of the stories of Jesus' life. And it is an adventure. And one of Jesus' primary um, objectives during his ministry was to try and reorient his listeners' image of God. You see, they thought they knew God. They were pretty confident that they knew who God liked and who God didn't, who God favored, who God didn't, who was in, who was out. And so Jesus had his work cut out for him in trying to reorient people's image of God. And I'm super excited about the text today because not only does it give us a glimpse into the heart of God, but it also shows us the power of context. And so... Let's start with where we left off a couple of weeks ago. Do you remember that? A couple of weeks ago? Quick recap. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He's on his way to his imminent death. He knows it. He expects it. His rhetoric is intensified because time is short. So miracles are down and um, warnings are up. Time is of the essence and he needs to get his message across to his listeners before he is executed. And so let's have a look where we left off at Luke uh, chapter 13. We're picking up in verse 22. I'll be reading from the New Testament for everyone, but you can follow along in whatever translation is your favorite. And of course, the text will be on the screen. Sorry, I'm fighting a summer sore throat. I've been COVID tested. I've been to the doctor. It's nothing. I feel like we need to wear lanyards or t-shirts or something. This is not COVID. It's just a cough. (laughs) Anyway, this is what Luke tells us. Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he went, making his way towards Jerusalem. Master, somebody said to him, will there be only a few who are saved? Now, this is the question on everyone's minds in Jesus' day. It still is for many of us today, right? Have you ever been in a class or a training session and you're dying to ask a question? You either don't understand something or you want to know something, but you feel like you're the only one and you don't want to ask the question because you'll feel stupid. And then someone saves your bacon. Someone else asks the question. And then you realize, guess what? That was the question on everybody's mind. Well, this was that question. It was on everyone's mind. This questioner was looking for confirmation of a prevailing assumption of the day. He was asking Jesus, How few and who will be saved? And Jesus is going to turn his speculation from how few and who to the personal challenge. Will it be you? Will it be you? And to understand Jesus' answer, it hangs on two things. One is inhabiting an image that he shares, and the second is comprehending the context. So we need to inhabit the image and comprehend the context. First of all, the image. It's how Jesus closes this whole section, this whole sermon. And it's a beautiful lens through which we see the heart of God. So let's have a look. Let's skip to the bottom to verse 34 and just see the image that Jesus leaves his listeners with. Luke 13, 34, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you kill the prophets and you stone the people sent to you. That's God's messengers, those who were to give the people the word from God. How many times did I want to collect your children like a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you would have none of it? Look, your house has been abandoned. Now, this is insider language and insider imagery. Jerusalem was the seat of the Jewish religion. It's where the temple was. It represented actually the whole Jewish nation. You just had to say the word Jerusalem and people envisioned the whole Jewish nation and all that it stood for. It's like us when we refer to, you know, the Maple Leaf. We know it's, it's a general reference to Canada. 
And Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. This is an emotionally charged double address. This is deep lament. Jesus is in pain here. He's, he's agonizing over the fate of his people. And he uses this common barnyard image that they would all have been familiar with. This scene of a hen who's got her brood under her wings and she's giving her life to save her chicks, either from a ravaging fire or torrential rain or a menacing predator. She's protecting them. She's giving her life for them. And this is the image we need to hold as we unpack the text from today. But why is Jesus grieving for them? He's the one about to die. He's the one going to Jerusalem to be executed. And yet he's grieving for them. You see, he sees them as vulnerable chicks just running everywhere to and fro, about to be devoured by a ravaging enemy oblivious to the impending danger that they're about to face. He sees their house, that is Jerusalem, that is the nation of Israel, being abandoned. Now when he uses this word abandoned, and here's the second thing, context. The first is image, the second is context. When he uses these words, your house will be abandoned, he is referring to a very dark time in their history, and they knew it. Those words were familiar to them. Jerusalem had been destroyed by their enemy, the Babylonians. The temple was destroyed. People were slaughtered, and those who weren't slaughtered were carried off into exile. And Jesus sees this about to happen again. He knows it, and he's trying desperately to warn them. He wants to prevent it. And so back to our question, we have the image and we have the context. Master. Will there be only a few that are saved? Now, why is this guy asking this? What does this guy think he needs to be saved from? We naturally assume ultimate salvation, right? What's gonna, who's going to heaven when they die? And this is a classic example of why cultural context is so important. For Jesus, he's talking about something to be saved from that's imminent, that's on the horizon, that's about to happen. This reference to the destruction of Jerusalem and the abandonment of your house tells us that. It's something historical. It's something present. For this guy, though, he's worried about salvation after death. And we have historical evidence of this, that the mindset that was circulating at the time of Jesus was that the Jewish people were obsessed with this. They were obsessed with who was going to make it. They believed that only a few would be saved. Non-Jews wouldn't be saved. Blemished Jews wouldn't be saved. Now, I have no idea what a blemished Jew is, but in some of the historical literature we have, we see it being restricted down to non-Jews and blemished Jews need not apply. There's no hope for you. And so this was the haunting question behind this man's question. What he's really asking Jesus, will it be me? Will it be me? One brave soul in the class dared to ask what was on everybody else's mind. Am I Jewish enough? Am I unblemished enough? And Jesus' answer is a complete departure from popular opinion, which his answers usually were. It's not that future salvation wasn't important to Jesus or that it was irrelevant. But he's been teaching about the kingdom of God, that is, life as God intends it now, his peace-loving, enemy-loving way, not just about heaven, and yet not exclusive of heaven. Jesus has both on his radar. You see, the kingdom of God is both now and not yet. You'll hear us say that when we talk about the kingdom of God. There's elements of it that are present now. We call them inbreakings, like inbreakings of heaven. When someone's uh, marriage is restored, their body's healed, they've encountered Jesus, there's mental or emotional healing, all of these beautiful things. That's the inbreaking of the kingdom of God, life as God intends it. And yet it's also gonna be fulfilled more fully when all of creation is reconciled to God one day. So how does Jesus answer 
this guy's question. Is it true that only a few will be saved? Well, in typical Jesus fashion, he doesn't answer the question directly, and he answers it wonderfully ambiguously. And he seizes the opportunity to address both concerns, both the present, what is about to happen if they don't adopt the Jesus way, and and, and the future, ultimate salvation. And this is his answer, and it might surprise us. Verse 23, he says, struggle hard. Struggle hard, Jesus replied, to get in by the narrow gate, or some of your Bibles might say the narrow door. Let me tell you, he says, many of you will try to get in and won't be able to. Now, I suspect that this pushes against some of our assumptions. You see, the word struggle here, or strive, means concerted effort. It actually comes from um, athletic vocabulary, where athletes need to struggle, strive, strain towards their training and their goal. It's hard, Jesus is saying, the door to the kingdom of God, life as God intends it. This peacemaking, enemy-loving, self-giving, countercultural way of life is hard. It requires intentionality. It requires striving. I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but have you ever been walking around the per- perimeter of a mall? Um, there's this plaza on Woodlawn, and there's a Beauclair and a Home Sense and a Michaels and a few other things. And sometimes I'll just be, you know, walking along the perimeter. And as I walk past the Home Sense, the doors, they just open up. <laughs> they just open up. I hadn't intended to go into Home Sense, but guess what? That's a sign to me. The doors opened. And so, what do you do? You walk in. When you get a sign, you walk in. Jesus' door isn't that kind of a door. It's more intentional than that. He is rejecting uh, the security systems that we depend on in the world, the violence, the power, the control, the money hoarding, all those things we reach for, for security or affirmation, the things that come naturally to us. Jesus' door, the kingdom way, requires commitment and intentionality. And it's a challenge for some of us because I think sometimes we assume that it's just belief. That's all we have to do. We just have to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. But that doesn't seem to align with Jesus' teaching here, does it? He says struggle hard. Knowing about him, believing that he is who he says he is, doesn't seem to cut it in this text. And yet it's not new. We actually know that belief in the Hebrew mindset, in the mindset of scripture, is not just an agreement with an idea, but a living out of a belief. You see, belief is a doing word. It's not just a mental thing that we do. It's a doing word. When our actions coincide with what our mind subscribes. When our actions coincide with what our mind subscribes. It's not enough to mentally agree with an idea. That's not belief in scripture. The idea must impact the way we live and the way we, we, we think and respond. That's actually what we call repentance. Uh, changing direction. It's not just saying sorry. Sorry, oops, sorry. It's actually changing direction. It's turning the other way based on new information or based on an idea, or based on belief. You can believe that Jesus loves enemies, but repentance means turning from hating enemies to loving our enemies. I believe that Jesus loves justice, but repentance means I will work with Jesus towards justice. Do you see what that means? Do you see the difference? Do you see what's going on here? Belief births repentance. There's no contradiction in Jesus' text here. When he says struggle hard, he is not, he's not contradicting belief. Belief is a doing word. It's a striving word. And then he ups the urgency with some pretty intense imagery. Let's look at verse 25. He says, when the householder gets up and shuts the door, at that moment, you will begin to stand outside and knock at the door and say, Master, open the door for us. And then he will say in response, I don't know where you've come from. And then you'll begin to say, well, we ate with you and we drank with you and you taught in our streets. 
And he will say to you, I don't know where you people are from. Be off with you, you wicked lot. And that's where you'll find weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in God's God's kingdom and you yourselves thrown out. And here's where it gets beautifully ambiguous. This is a nod to future salvation. When we hear Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the answers, these are guys long dead. So Jesus must be talking about some afterlife uh, event here. He's talking about the future. He's referencing time after death. And he says, struggle hard. He doesn't say, oh, don't worry, you're Jewish. Or don't worry, you have the pedigree and the prophets. Or don't worry, you believe the right things. But struggle hard. Let your feet follow your belief. Let your heart follow your belief. If not, he will say, I don't know where you people are from. And here's context again. You see, in Jesus' day, knowing where someone was from, knowing their ancestry was an indication of knowing the person. And Jesus is rejecting that idea of merely knowing about him being the door to the kingdom of God. Yeah, 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 I know your daddy, you're in. No, 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 that's not what he's saying. He's saying struggle hard. The kingdom of God or life as God intends it is not a right of way. It's a way of life. Being Jewish was not a right of way. Holding right beliefs is not a right of way. Being baptized is not a right of way. Knowing tons of scripture is not a right of way. It's a way of life. The kingdom of God is a way of life. Struggle hard, Jesus says. You don't just get it. You live it. Strive in it. Struggle for it. And in his story, they persist. They go on in verse 26. But we ate with you, and we drank with you, and you taught in our streets. And he'll say to you, I I don't know where you people are from. Be off with you, you wicked lot. You see, They appeal to association with Jesus. Remember, eating in the first century with people was a sign of inclusion or intimacy. They're saying, you know us, we hung out with you. Remember, you stopped by for a beer. I went to hear you preach that one time. Remember? They're relying on their status and their knowledge of Jesus, and Jesus is going to have none of it. He says, be off with you, you wicked lot. Now, that word wicked, (laughs) wow, That would have been very disturbing for them to hear. Alarming, offending. They would have been thinking, who is he calling wicked anyway? We're not wicked. We know who the wicked ones are. Because in their minds, the wicked ones were the enemies, were the non-Jews. So what's he saying here? What he's saying is their knowing of him, their acquaintance with him, hasn't changed their life or their character. And maybe, maybe you know people like that. They go to church regularly. They have a Bible verse for everything. They never cuss and swear. But their hearts seem really inhospitable. Their attitudes just don't seem to resemble Jesus. In these folks' mind, Israel was saved by being Jewish. By believing the right things, having the right postal code, having the the, the right bloodline, knowing the right deity. And Jesus is saying, no. No. And here's the kicker, friends. Here was the gut punch for me when I was studying this passage. Who are the people pounding on the door? Enemies of Jesus? The Romans or Herod or Pilate or the ones who would ultimately crucify him? No. They're not the ones pounding on the door. They're not the ones who oppose Jesus, but those who thought they knew him. This is the sobering detail. This is the, this is the shocker. It's not that he just doesn't recognize them, but he actually calls them wicked. And this is unbelievable for his hearers. They were God's people after all. But Jesus uses this word intentionally. He is trying to shock them. He's trying to wake them up. Remember, he's headed to Jerusalem, imminent death. Soon it'll be over. Time is of the essence. He's shocking them into a realization here. They had the answers. They had the scriptures. They had the pedigree. They had the rules for everything. They knew who the wicked ones were. It was the Romans. It was the pagans. It was the blemished ones. That demographic over there, those people over there, they knew. 
To be clear, Jesus isn't being mean here. Jesus is emphasizing urgency. He's not limiting entry. He's emphasizing urgency. Can you hear the desperation in the questioner's voice now that you know the context? Are only a few being saved? Are only a few who won the divine lottery? Only a few who will please God? Only a few who are unblemished enough? And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. And while we often read this through a lens of very few will be saved, with the image that we have of the mother hen longing to gather her chicks and protect them and even give her life for them, and with the cultural context that we now have, we can see that Jesus is not limiting entry. He is emphasizing urgency. You see, in contrast to their narrow way of thinking, Jesus says this, people will come from east and west and north and south, and they're going to sit down to feast in God's kingdom. And listen to this, he says, some who are last will be first and some of the first will be last. You see, the door might be narrow, but many will come. It might be narrow, but, but lots are going to get through. All those who want to get in, who strive to get in, who struggle to get in, will get in. And it might not be who you expect either, he's saying. They're coming from everywhere. He's painting this picture of diversity. He's not limiting entry. But it has to be intentional. Not like the home sense doors, right? You have to duck your head, go in, want to be there. The door that Jesus talks about requires desire and intentionality. But what's inside is worth it. What's inside, Jesus describes as a banquet feast. And that is such a familiar picture for these people because in their scriptures, when the kingdom of God comes, when heaven eventually comes and touches earth, it will be like a banquet, a feast. And that makes sense, right? When you're living in an agrarian society and the food is precarious and you have to rely on weather and seasons. Look at this passage that he's alluding to. It's from one of their favorite prophets, the prophet Isaiah. It's a promise of life to come, and this is what it says. I'm reading from the message because it's way more delicious than the message. Isaiah 25, verses 6 to 8. But here on this mountain, now when it says mountain, it means Jerusalem, where Jesus is headed. But here on this mountain, the God of angel armies will throw a feast for all the people of the world, a feast of the finest foods, a feast with vintage wines, a feast of seven courses, a feast with lavish gourmet desserts. Well, you got me at desserts. And here on this mountain, God will banish the pall of doom hanging over all people, the shadow of doom darkening all darkening all nations. Yes, he'll banish death forever and God will wipe the tears from every face. He'll remove every sign of disgrace from his people wherever they are. Yes, God says so. See why they love that passage? What a picture that is. Jesus is not picturing a closed table for just a few. He's picturing an open banquet for as many who want to be there, as many who are striving to be there. And he's been doing that for the past three years in his ministry. He's been setting up these little tasting stations like at Costco. All along the way, stations of God's ultimate feast, tasting stations of the kingdom of God, life as God intends it. He's been feeding people who had no food. He's been providing abundant wine for celebrations. He's been eating with people who were excluded by the religious establishment, excluded by their families and their communities. He's been restoring dignity. These are the tasting stations of the kingdom of God. He's been showing people how beautiful God's way is. He's reminding them that the door might be narrow, but it's not exclusive. He's reminding them that people, all kinds of people from all over are coming. They're coming intentionally. They're coming with differences. They're coming with baggage. They're coming because they want to be part of this beautiful way. And they're striving. And this would have been very, very um, real to them because travel in the first century was very, very difficult. You had to really want to go someplace to go someplace because there was no Timmy's along the way. There was no baby changing stations. There was no air conditioned donkeys. It was hard to get anywhere. Many are coming, Jesus says. Many are finding it. Many are wanting the Jesus way, the way of peace and wholeness and harmony and equity and belonging. And it's not who you're going to expect either, Jesus says. It's 
obvious that the order of inclusion has been reversed. The last will be first and the first will be last. Jesus flips the question from how few and who to will it be you? Will it be you? You see what Jesus is doing? He's addressing both the possible, both possible concerns, the concern of imminent uh, salvation from what's coming and future salvation. And then the scene concludes with this. Just then, some Pharisees came up and spoke to Jesus. Get away from here, they said, because Herod wants to kill you. Go ahead and tell that fox, Jesus said. Look here, I'm casting out demons today and tomorrow and completing my healings. I'll be finished on the third day. Now, didn't your ears just perk up? On the third day. But I have to continue my travels today, tomorrow, and the day after that. It couldn't happen that a prophet could perish except in Jerusalem. Now that's pure sarcasm because it happened all the time. They didn't have to be in Jerusalem to be healed. But with this mention of the third day, Jesus is nodding to a future salvation. The cosmic work that he's going to do when all of creation will be reconciled to God. And he's saying, it's the religious people who kill the prophets. It's it's the God followers who kill God's messengers, people who think they're in, who may actually be out. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how many times did I want to collect your children like a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you would have none of it? Look, your house has been abandoned. Let me tell you this, you will never see me until you are prepared to say a blessing upon you. Welcome in the name of the Lord. Now that's just an ancient way of saying, unless you recognize me as God in your midst, unless you embrace the Jesus way, unless you adopt my way, unless you come through my door, I can't protect you. If you reject me, Jerusalem will be decimated. If you reject me, you won't taste the delicacies of the kingdom of God. You won't experience harmony and wholeness and beauty and equity and all that the Jesus way, life as God intends it, has to offer. Are only a few being saved? Jesus flips the question. It's not how few and who, but will it be you? He's not locking them out, but he's saying, do you want to be rescued? Are you willing to strive in this countercultural way? The mother hen is here waiting, arms outstretched, wings outstretched to gather you, to rescue you, to give herself for you. Do you want to come? Do you want to come? And that invitation is still open, friends. The door is open. And the doormat says, welcome home. Do you want to enter into the Jesus way? Here at Lakeside, we are striving to live the Jesus way. We don't always get it right. And to be honest, it's hard. It's hard sometimes. I see why Jesus said struggle, strive. It's easier to retaliate in hate than extend love, right? It's easier to ignore injustice in the world and just, you know, hunker down in our privileged bubble. It's easier to serve ourselves than to serve others. It's easier to hoard wealth than to give generously. It's easier to nurse a grudge than to offer forgiveness. But we're in this together. We're in this together and we're striving together to live as God intends it. To hopefully be an outpost of heaven a tasting station of what the kingdom of God is like, a tasting station of that ultimate banquet when everyone sits around the table and feasts with a place of belonging. And if that's a conversation that you'd like to have, if, if you want to know how to enter into this Jesus way, it's a conversation I would love to have with you. And I'm gonna wait at the front here. And if you wanna have that conversation, I would be happy to have that conversation with you. Our prayer ministers, Damon and Sarah, will be at the side. They would love to have that conversation with you, to pray with you, to introduce you to the Jesus way. Kathleen is online, and she would love to have that conversation with you if you reach out online. Or you can text the number on the screen. There's actually a person behind that number, and we would be happy to connect with you. 
I just want to invite you to ponder for a moment as we close. This is probably a conversation that's longer than just a couple of moments here this morning, but maybe on your long drives this summer, if you're going on road trips or around your table or a bonfire in your backyard, we could be asking ourselves these questions. Where have we individually or collectively fallen into complacency, just relying on our belief system? Where in our lives might our actions not coincide with what our minds subscribe to? Where our feet aren't following our belief? In what ways do we maybe look more like the world than the Jesus way? In our priorities, our values, the way we respond, the way we look at others? What images of God are most true? And this one might take a little longer. You might want to pause with this. Think about this. Do your images of God actually align with what you claim to believe about God? When you think about God, when you go through your day, what characterizes your thoughts about God? That's your true image of God. We have these questions on our Luke page uh, under the deeper dive section. Every week we have questions there. If you ever want to just go there for more information or questions to reflect on, they're there. I just really want to encourage you to have those conversations as together we strive and we struggle in the Jesus way. So I'm going to invite our prayer ministers up and I just want to close and bless you as you go. Is that okay? If you're able, I actually wouldn't mind inviting you to stand sort of as a symbolic way. We're in this together and we're not all getting it right and we're on different places in this journey. But man, the tasting stations, they give us a taste of the banquet. So I just want to bless you as you go this week. As you become a tasting station of the kingdom of God, of life as God intends it. Have an awesome day, an awesome weekend. We love you, Lakeside. Love you guys online. And uh, we'll see you next week, if not before. Bless you, friends. <laughs>